the men, which was punishable by death. We mentioned the fact there's historical records indicate that that happened, that Romans allowed them to, to kill men for having done this. They grab Paul, uh, they are beating him to death. Uh, and then in the process, uh, because of the uh, situation of the Antonio forgers being able to look down on the Temple Mount, uh, their word goes to the commander, Claudius Lysias, uh, who goes down with two centurions, therefore at least 200 soldiers to rescue the Apostle Paul. Uh, he is thinking that Paul is an Egyptian uh, a rebel, you know, they are somebody revolting against the government that has, uh, as he says here, recently had 4,000 men out in the desert or the wilderness. Historical records talk to us about this guy, this Egyptian, during this time period, and at one point in time, he had 40,000 uh, followers, and so the commander was uh, very concerned that maybe he's captured him, and he has this guy that's been creating so many problems. Of course, then once he is, uh, in a sense, rescued from the crowd and now bound and being hauled away by the Romans, Paul begins to speak to him in Greek, which kind of <laughs> causes him to, to do a double take. Does it sound real Egyptian there? And uh, speaking the language of the Romans, and uh, Paul identifies himself as a Jew from Cilicia, from Tarsus, uh, and uh, uh, as he says in our text, of no mean city. That is, it's a free city. Uh, this doesn't mean that Paul's a Roman citizen, but it means he's a citizen of a city uh, that uh, within the Roman Empire, uh, and uh, Claudius better listen to what he has to say. Paul says, really, all I want to do is speak to the crowd here. Can you, can you let me do that? Uh, and, of course, that is what he is uh, about to do. Maybe one other little consideration of uh, Paul is he's standing on these steps uh, and wiping the, the blood off of his face and off of his head to be able to say a few words. Uh, again, they weren't trying to rough him up a little bit. They were trying to kill him. That um, We could kind of uh, at least speculate that Paul's probably in his early 60s at this point. Uh, he's, uh, he's no, uh, in that day and age, not a real young guy, uh, but he gets up from this beating, and he's going to use it to, to share the gospel. Now, that's good to keep in mind when you see how respectful he is of the crowd that he's trying to uh, address here. And the stated application for this text right up front is, Paul lays out a model for sharing uh, your testimony, and, uh, and we can learn from this. Um, I... Uh, you know, we take, when we take folks on missions trips, we usually uh, will go over this, and of course, uh, we'll do this with the high school kids. Uh, they have to put together their testimonies, write them, on, uh, write them out, and then kind of uh, read them off, and then kind of fine tune them in a three by five card and so forth, so they're ready, because they need to have these kind of elements. Now, Paul's is certainly an adult conversion. There is a definite before, how, and after to his, uh, to his testimony. And uh, between services, uh, one of the guys came to me and said, he said, he leaned to his wife and said, I'm not sure if I've ever heard your testimony. <laughs> and she opened her Bible and pulled out the card that she had it written on from her mission strip and said, read this. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things that we all ought to do. We all have, should have thought through our testimony. What is it? What was my life like? What are some of the elements of it that people can relate to that don't know the Lord? How is it that uh, I actually came to faith in Christ? Uh, avoiding religious terminology. Uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, help when you say, I just knelt and then knew that I was sa saved. No, you, you probably said something. I mean, you know, uh, th there's, there's got to be some concrete things that people can grasp a hold of. And Paul does these things. He lays out a, a, a beautiful example for us here. Well, let's look at the first five verses. Uh, these are the circumstances of life's, uh, Paul's life before uh, conversion. Again, standing on the steps of the Antonia Fortress, looking over the Temple Mount. Uh, thousands uh, gathered around him, uh, broken and bloody. Uh, he says, brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, 
as also the high priest bears me witness in all the council of the elders that would do the Sanhedrin, from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem uh, to be punished. So uh, before he, in a sense, lays out his before story, uh, we want to note a couple of things about how he addresses them. And we see his passion before this audience. You never got, you know, the, the idea is not to share your testimony so you go, I did that, check that baby off. No, the idea is you actually want to lead them to the Lord. Uh, you want to be able to share your testimony effectively. Uh, and, uh, and we'll never be able to do that if we don't care about and have a sense of passion for the people that we're sharing with. These are the guys that just beat Paul to a pulp, and yet there's a lot of passion in what he has to say. Uh, it's a couple of things to note. Uh, one is that uh, uh, how he addresses them as brethren and, and fathers. You know, it, doesn't, it doesn't help uh, when we go to share our testimony with a, a person or a group of people to address them as um, uh, as a, 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 well, if you, you idiots out there would get it together and come to the Lord. See, that doesn't help, you know, and, um, uh, you know, uh, sarcasm doesn't help in winning, winning somebody over here. And Paul's very re respectful for this very group of people that just tried to kill him. Secondly, in, a, in accusing, instead of accusing them of participating in a riot, notice in verse 3, he says, uh, you're, you're zealous towards God. <laughs> Uh, well, that, yeah, that would be one way of putting that. <laughs> they just grabbed you and tried to kill you, you know. And rather than saying, saying, I don't know what you were doing trying to kill me. I haven't done anything. He says, man, you guys are zealous for God. That's awesome. It's like when he was standing up on uh, Mars Hill and talking to the, the Greek philosophers of the day. He, he doesn't get up there and say, you know, I was walking around your city. I saw all of these ridiculous idols. And I don't even know where you guys are coming from. Do you really buy into this? No, he doesn't say that. He says, I was rocking around the city. I saw all the idols. Uh, and I, I see that you are very religious people. In fact, I noticed an idol over here to the unknown God. And that's very interesting because I want to tell you about that unknown God today. That, that's Paul. I mean, that's, that's how we're, we're, we're to do it. Uh, he's going to share his testimony. He's going to build a faith, uh, build a case for, for why his, uh, his faith is credible to, to this group of people. We need to be able to do, uh, do the same. Certainly, we can learn, learn from him. Thirdly, he admitted that um, he was guilty of what they were doing that, that very day. Uh, they, they had uh, you know, grabbed him. They had beat him uh, and so forth. He said, I used to do the same thing. You know what you did to me today? I used to do the same thing. I used to, I had letters actually from the Sanhedrin. I was on my way to uh, Damascus. I used to arrest people and, and do the very same thing. You guys are not so different than me. I'm not that very different from you. This is all obviously a very condensed version of, of Paul's testimony, but trying to relate to the, to the people that he's sharing his testimony with. And then he speaks to them in Hebrew, verse 2. He spoke to them in the Hebrew language, and they kept all the more silent. This means that he is a... He's a very devout religious Jew. Not, every, not all the Jews really could speak Hebrew fluently. It was an issue from the time they came out of the Babylonian captivity. In fact, you could, because Aramaic is the language, it's kind of more of the street language, uh, very common to the Jews in that time, kind of a derivative of, uh, of Hebrew itself. Uh, but, uh, you can uh, go back and read Nehemiah. When the people uh, come back after the Babylonian captivity and Nehemiah is addressing them and rebuking the Jewish men for having married uh, unbelieving Gentile wives, and he makes reference to it, your kids can't even speak Hebrew anymore. And so it's, this is a, a longstanding issue. So the fact that Paul is able to speak Hebrew, they're like, whoa, okay, he's, he's well-trained. He's somebody. He's not just a Jew. He's a very devout uh, religious Jew. Uh, and then... Uh, secondly, uh, the, uh, the circumstances include his uh, very, very Jewish background. Again, he begins, you know, it's easy for Paul to pile on the credentials to this crowd. Uh, over in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, he, he mentions the fact that he was a leading rabbi of his day. In this crowd, a lot of people would have known him. Other rabbis knew who he was. Uh, all the members of the Sanhedrin, uh, many of whom may have been there, would have known who he was. The thousands of Christians in this crowd would have known uh, who he was, uh, but certainly there'll be thousands that didn't know he lays out his credentials. I'm a Jew, 
I'm a native of Tarsus. I was brought up in, in Jerusalem, <clears throat> which is kind of an interesting little insight. We kind of uh, maybe in our minds picture Paul being raised at home uh, in Tarsus. And then at some point in time, he kind of comes to uh, Jerusalem to enter the uh, rabbinic school of Gamaliel. But apparently, uh, again, his, his father was a Pharisee, his father before him. Uh, and Paul had been groomed, and, and it seems as a child was brought uh, to Jerusalem uh, and brought up in, the, in that city trained by Gamaliel, and this would have uh, certainly uh, turned a lot of heads. There's only seven, seven rabbis in all of Judaism that have the title Rabban, and, uh, and Gamaliel was the first one. Uh, there's only seven. Very famous still in, uh, in Judaism today. Uh, he is the grandson of Rabbi Halal. There's two basically uh, in, in Jesus' day, <clears throat> and still today, <clears throat> you know, Halal and Shammai were the, the two uh, debatable uh, issues of the day, and whether it was divorce or whatever the subject might be, these are the guys that they would quote. Again, uh, uh, Halal, which I remember that by Halal as L, like in liberal. His, his was called free interpretation, the way they interpret, interpreted the law of Moses. So they were more liberal in how they interpreted things. Shammai, on the other hand, held to, and Paul says, I'm with him. I hold to the strictness of the law. That's the phrase that he uses. He's not just describing himself as a Pharisee. He says, man, I, I studied with Gamaliel, but I hold to Shammai. I'm, I'm the conservative guy here uh, in, uh, in this crowd. And, uh, and of course, this would have kind of at least, if not endeared, it would have added a lot of credibility to the people that he was speaking to there on the Temple Mount. And then he was a zealous persecutor uh, of the church. Makes reference to the fact that either he was minimally a representative of the Sanhedrin or he was a member of the Sanhedrin receiving letters from them to go to Damascus to continue to perch, uh, persecute those of the way which is how uh, Christians were referred to in Jerusalem and Israel during the first uh, century. All of this covers his life prior to conversion and uh, in our life our testimony should have that element. There we should again we're there's actually three kinds of testimonies, but the adult conversion, there should be a clear before, what my life was like, how and, uh, and after. Uh, and there's a balance between those elements. I remember as a young Christian hearing guys share their testimony, which sometimes consisted of uh, the, uh, the amount of alcohol they could consume and still function somehow. Uh, and then they got saved and came to the Lord. You know, it was more of a, what I call a bragamony versus a a test, actual testimony. Paul is covering things about his life prior to Christ, but it's to gain credibility and lead to a point where he can say, then I had this experience, and now this is what's different in my life. Uh, our testimony should, should cover those same kinds of things. We also note that he was like, like a man like Nicodemus, who was the, the rabbi of Israel, uh, the rabbi of Jerusalem at the time, he's a very religious person. Yeah, of course, religion can't make anyone righteous. Uh, though he was religious and zealous for the law, he still needed uh, uh, a savior. So second, then, comes the, the how, the confrontation on the Damascus Road. For all of us, you know, our story is different. Mine, mine might be the, the desperation one night in New Wano, as I would title, and how I came to the Lord, and so forth. Uh, we all have a story. It's all a little different. God can use uh, use it all. But here deals with his uh, conversion here on the Damascus Road in verse 6 to 11. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid. But they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go into Damascus. And there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. So the confrontation begins as he's persecuting believers. And he talks about his actual experience, probably 
None of us will have had an experience uh, like this, a blinding light and hearing a voice from heaven, but uh, this was uh, Paul's experience. This is what actually happened to him and the circumstances around it, and he's explaining that. And those people in that crowd, those thousands of guys, would have been up for hearing the story. They're kind of religious guys. They believe God does miracles and does stuff like this. So, uh, so when he says, uh, you know, this light blinded me, I heard this voice. You know, there's not people in their crowd going, I don't think that happened. You know, it's, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if Paul would have shared his testimony the same way, you know, at the University of Hawaii uh, Campus Center today. He might have shared it a little differently. I don't know how, how people feel about miracles and so forth in some places around the world. But this crowd uh, believed that God did uh, miracles. There's a few Sadducees that, that aren't, aren't into it in the crowd probably, uh, but uh, most of them are tracking, uh, tracking quite along as he shares his testimony. I'll also say that uh, <clears throat> Paul, we see him quite willing to do this, and we'll see it a couple more times. As he's uh, on trial, he never defends himself. He always tries to share his testimony, get the gospel in rather than defend himself. Uh, but um, I think by and large, Paul was pretty much ashamed of his testimony. Uh, as he writes about it in 1 Timothy 1.12, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. You know, if you track Paul's life chronologically, he became more and more convinced as time went on of how much of a sinner that he actually was, which is a sign of maturity. The person that believes, you know, I've sinned a little, I'm not that bad, that is a very immature believer. The person that is walking closer and closer and closer with the Lord all the time, the closer you get to Jesus uh, and his bright light, uh, you know, it's just like looking sometimes in those mirrors and, and the, the light is just a little too good, you know. I don't know that I really wanted to see that, you know. But um, uh, walking closer with Jesus, we, we should be becoming more and more aware of our sin all the time. By the end of Paul's life, he says, I'm pretty sure I'm like the worst guy around. Uh, he goes, man, I was a, a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was an insolent man. I just hope some way God could look at my life and go, if God can save that guy, Paul, he can save anybody. And that, that was where he was coming from. He recognized that uh, he becomes the object or the example of God's grace. How great is God's grace? Well, look at Paul. Again, it's one of the amazing, miraculous stories and proofs of Christianity uh, that we have. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, certainly uh, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus is, is right behind it. But again, Paul never does this as what I call a bragamony. Uh, it's always a testimony. It was always his uh, actual experience. He might have been ashamed of it in many ways, but he knew that God could, uh, could use it powerfully. Secondly, about the confrontation, and include this this very important revelation that Jesus is alive. We see that in verse 8. Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And, uh, and certainly our testimonies need to include how we came to know Jesus. It might have been getting on your knees in your bedroom one night like I did. It might have been a harvest crusade. It might have been hearing some guy on TV or the Internet or a friend sharing. We all have a story to tell, but it all needs to center and come to the person of Jesus Christ. What he's done for you, what his word said to you, what it is to know that your sins are, for, are, are forgiven. Uh, and that uh, uh, in this case, this crowd uh, understood Jesus to have been crucified because he was an imposter. I mean, again, uh, <clears throat> Jesus of Nazareth was the man in terms of uh, there was nobody in Israel that didn't know who he was. The number of miracles and so forth. This crowd knew well that he marched uh, uh, into that city on the back of a donkey uh, proclaiming himself to be the Messiah in fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. They are well aware of the fact that uh, there was a, a plot to kill him. And in fact, the Sanhedrin actually did that and crucified him 
They're well aware that he was placed in a tomb with a Roman seal and a Roman guard. But it turns out, they're told later, that his disciples came in the middle of the night and stole the body. And now they say that he's alive. Uh, and, uh, and Paul says, listen, I'll tell you the rest of the story because I believe what you believe. But in fact, I heard his voice. I saw his light. And he spoke to me, Jesus uh, is alive. A uh, very important part of our testimony is our actual experience in coming to faith in Christ. He gives some very important details here. Uh, and, uh, and, it, and it impacts his life, of course, uh, afterwards. And our testimony should, uh, again, require the same uh, kinds of elements. Now, <clears throat> there's two other kinds of testimonies. There's Paul's, the adult conversion. Uh, there is uh, the person who receives Christ as a child uh, and then maybe uh, through teenage years or young adult years or whatever it, may, it might be, kind of walks away from the Lord. And then there's, uh, as an adult, a recommitment uh, to, to the Lord. And then there are those that receive the Lord as a child uh, and they just uh, walk faithfully with God and know his grace uh, through, through their lives and never experience uh, all of those things. Which do you think is the better testimony? Sometimes people will say to me, oh man, you've got a really great testimony. I go, no, I don't have a horrible testimony. Are you kidding me? My kids both have awesome testimonies, but I have a horrible testimony. I'm just curious. Is a uh, uh, little survey, a little audience participation. I, I never do this, but uh, I'm just curious. How, how many of you got saved as, as adults? You didn't know the Lord. You just, as adults, you made, made commitments. Uh, at least half or so. How many of you got saved as a child growing up? You received the Lord, and you've just kind of always, always walked with the Lord. Fewer. God bless you. <laughs> there is hope for your kids and your grandkids. That's all I'm saying. There is hope. That's what you're praying for, right? I mean, you want your kids to have that testimony. Okay, and I assume everybody else is in that category of <clears throat> maybe grew up hearing the gospel, going to church, and at some point in time, you, um, you made a, a recommitment to the Lord. So... <clears throat> Our testimony will all differ, but still there can be an aspect of, of uh, we teach even the, even the kids in the youth group uh, that grow up, you know, knowing the Lord and everything. You still can say what your life could have been like had you not received the Lord. You've got friends. They're not Christians. What, are, what is their life? You can say, my life isn't like this, and it's not like this, and it's not like this either. I don't have these kind of issues in my life because I received the Lord. Let me tell you how it, how it did it. And my life is differently now because of that. Because also, I've got friends that struggle with this and this and brokenness and all. I don't experience those things because I've always walked to the Lord and known the Lord, and I can tell you he's faithful. See, everybody's got a story. Everybody's got a, a testimony to tell. Uh, Paul's is the classic uh, adult conversion. It begins with, uh, again, some circumstances uh, of his life before conversion, his story happens to be a confrontation on the Damascus Road. And thirdly, uh, the results of his conversion in verse 20, uh, 12 to 20. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem, was praying in the temple, that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly. For they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, uh, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Paul continues his story here. He talks about, again, uh, this idea is his conversion was by God's divine uh, intervention. And that is true of all of our lives as well. The reason that we got saved, God's divine intervention, which is a, a very important element for him. He's blinded on the Damascus road. He now knows that Jesus is alive. He gets into Damascus and Ananias is uh, sent to him. Now remember in chapter 9, Ananias doesn't even want to go. Saul of Tarsus, 
go to him. I want you to pray for him. Okay, I, I don't think we're really talking to the same, the same guy here, Lord. He's the guy trying to kill everybody. That's the guy we're hiding from. And, of course, he's a little convincing. God's good at that. A little convincing. Ananias goes over and prays for him. Paul's recounting that, uh, that story here. Uh, and, uh, and he quotes him uh, for a, a couple important reasons. Once he adds credibility to, to who Ananias is, this brother who is a Jew, did I mention he's a devout Jew and has a tremendous reputation among all the Jews in Damascus. He's the one that came over and said this to me. Again, he's kind of building you know, the credentials for, uh, for his own testimony in the gospel. And what Ananias does is he quotes the scriptures uh, as he makes reference to in verse 14, he will uh, and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. The just one is the Messiah. So it's a name for him. They would know that. They would be uh, familiar with it. And the just one, the righteous one, the Messiah, Paul says, has now commissioned me to take this message to all men. This is not my own idea. This is not my own de uh, doing. Uh, this is God intervention uh, into my life. Uh, and, of course, that's going to include uh, the Gentiles, but he's going to save the, the big G word for later. Uh, secondly, his conversion leads to, again, very important personal relationship with the Lord. Verse 14, uh, then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will. Uh, we can, as believers, know his will and do his will. Uh, he can lead and guide our lives. He can speak to us. There is still quite voice, lead us by the Holy Spirit, uh, illuminate the scriptures uh, to us. Uh, he can lead us because he is the Messiah. Now here's the, the just one, the, the reference for that is uh, being the Messiah is Jeremiah 33, 15. There are others, but here's a classic. Uh, in those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a, a branch of righteousness, uh, a name for the Messiah. He will execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely, and this is the name by which she, she will be called uh, the Lord, our righteousness. So uh, the city, uh, she, is going to be known by the Messiah being there. His name is the Lord, our righteousness, or the Lord, the just one. So uh, again, Ananias, a devout Jew, uh, good reputation, Paul says, in Damascus, came and said, hey, this is all the doing of the just one, of, of the Messiah. And Paul says, I now can know his will. He's going to lead me. He's going to guide me. I have a relationship with him. And the other change after my life, because of who he is, I now submit my life to him. And then he gives two examples of that submission. And one is baptism in verse 16. Uh, now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, one, one thing that needs to be cleared up here is just kind of the semantics of this verse. You could read it, and it could sound like, like Paul is, uh, is baptized, his sins are washed away, uh, and he's calling on the name of the Lord all simultaneously. And there's actually folks that use this verse as a pretext for what we call baptismal regeneration. They believe you're not really saved until you are baptized. Uh, but in reality, all the Greek verbs here, the baptize, the washing, the calling, are all in the aorist tense. It's all a, 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 a point in time, simple occurrence, we would say. And as uh, Philip Weiss uh, uh, says, Kenneth Weiss, I knew that didn't sound right. Maybe Philip was his brother. Kenneth Weiss puts it, uh, uh, having arisen, be baptized and wash away your sins, having previously called upon his name. And uh, so, the, you know, Paul is saved on the Damascus Road. Now he is baptized. It's an indication that his sins have been washed away. Uh, these are Jews. They're very familiar with baptism. They all, they all get baptized all the time. We probably don't realize that, but uh, if you were Gentile and you were going to become Jewish, proselytized, you had to be baptized. It was an indication. You walk through the water, you walk out the other side, and uh, the water is, is symbolic of this cleansing in your life. If you're a Jewish male and you're bringing a sacrifice to the temple, before you can present that sacrifice in the temple, you had to walk through the mikvah. You had to walk through the baptism and come out the other side. And uh, representative of your heart is now right to come before the presence of God. So these guys are familiar with this idea of baptism and what it means. And it means uh, purification. 
Uh, and Paul is saying, even though I was a Pharisee, even though I was a, a, a member or at least a representative of the Sanhedrin, even though I kept the most strictest form of the, the law, I still, when I came to Jesus Christ, he says, you need to be baptized. And, uh, and I said, yes, I will. I will submit my life to Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. I hear his voice. He is directing me. He is leading my life. And when he tells me to do something, I'm doing it. These are all after. He's talked about his life before. He's giving some very concrete things that this crowd could relate to uh, in terms of after uh, his life. Filled with the Spirit. Uh, he's baptized. Uh, again, Paul is born again of the Spirit. Talks about the fact that that he was there, his life again, some other references to the stoning of Stephen, uh, the miracles uh, and, uh, and so forth. But he's emphasizing again the Jewish elements of his experience uh, as he talks about, and then I went to the temple and prayed. And they're like, that's good. <laughs> you know, that's very good to do. Verse 17, now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple, I was in a trance, uh, and saw him saying to me, and I've just noticed once in a while there's a few of you that happens to. This is a regular occurrence here. People go into trances all the time around here. So we got a real New Testament church going. Uh, saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. Uh, so again, he's trying to find common ground to build his case. Hey, uh, as a believer, as a believer uh, in Jesus as the Messiah, he appeared to me. I still come to the temple. I still pray in the temple. Uh, you guys aren't that much different uh, than me. It's just that I've come to know the Messiah. But when I was here, he spoke to me. And he said that I should leave Jerusalem. And, and I did it. My life is different now. The Lord is guiding and directing uh, my life uh, in so many ways. Verse 19, so I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes who were uh, killing him. So uh, he said, again, here's what my life was like. Uh, and we do recall that when, that when he shows up, uh, 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 Peter, James, and John, James and the boys, they wouldn't have nothing to do with him. They're still kind of freaked out as, as well. And, uh, and it's Barnabas, remember, that shows up and kind of gives them the right hand of fellowship and talks with them. And then and Barnabas kind of has to intercede and go, no, this, this is a real deal. This guy is actually uh, uh, really, really safe. Are, are you skeptical when, when, the, when it's like that? There, there's a, a, a little news story going around of a pretty big time Hollywood type actor that just got saved. And I've read it and everything, and it's like, I sure hope he's saved. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just, could you just, you know, it's like, is he just saying, is this like a publicity deal? Or, you know, or I, you know, you just, you, you have a tendency to kind of want to, you know, not jump on board. I didn't share it on Facebook. I'm just like, Let's just kind of wait and see if this guy really begins to live it out here uh, a, a little bit. And, uh, uh, and these guys are very skeptical of Paul. Uh, but he says, you know, the Lord still spoke to me. And when he said I should leave, I, I submitted to that authority. Paul gives the circumstances before uh, the con confrontation on the Damascus Road. His, con his uh, conversion is by divine intervention. Uh, there's a few supernatural events uh, surrounding it. Uh, it may not be relative to our, uh, uh, again, uh, own testimonies, but we all have details. And then the results of the conversion. He's submitting to God's authority. He's baptized. He leaves Jerusalem. Jesus is directing his life. He has a personal relationship with him. And then fourthly, as a believer, Paul would not compromise the truth. And that's where he drops the, uh, <coughs> the bombshell here. Verse 21. Uh, then he said to me, uh, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And it kind of echoed and reverberated through the, the temple courts when he, when he did that. It would be going. But, uh, uh, and they listened to him until this word. Uh, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Now, the thing I find interesting about this is Paul is so careful to relate to his audience. Uh, he's so careful to kind of build a case for, for his, uh, who he is within Judaism still. Uh, he's very careful to, uh, to, uh, to help them understand his actual experience and that Jesus is the just one and so forth. Why, why in the world would he not just kind of drop that last phrase? Uh, and he has sent me to the 
other guys out there, you know, just slip in a different little word because he's trying to reach this Jewish audience. And I, and I thought about this a lot, and, I, uh, and it kind of occurred to me in, in reading the passage over several times in my, not the Bible on my screen, but the, the actual printed one uh, of a few that I've got on my desk, and, and one of them happens to be a red letter edition. Red letter meaning the words of Jesus are in red. And when it comes to that phrase, it's in red. This is the word of God. Paul's, and Paul's not going to mess with it. In other words, it's Jesus. Jesus this is a direct quote from Jesus. And when he tells the story, he's not going to change one word, regardless of the implications. I mean, he had to know they'd go crazy. I mean, Paul had to know that. But I think he makes a very, a very volitional decision to go, I'm, I'm just not going to compromise when it comes to the word of God. Uh, and that's what Jesus said. I'm going to tell him what Jesus said. Period. Now, you know, again, we, we don't start out in, in our sharing, our witness, our testimony to see, see if we can offend people right off the bat. You know, and Paul doesn't, does, he doesn't do that. Uh, but uh, at the same time, he has shared his testimony. Uh, and at the end, he's talking about how God is directing his life now. And this is what Jesus says to him. Uh, and he does not shy away from Again, when he's going to quote the Bible, he's going to quote the Bible and, uh, and not change it in any way. And we certainly have to admire him uh, for that. And, uh, and of course, they, I mentioned they, they go ballistic, uh, verse 22. Away with such a fellow from the earth, he's not fit to, uh, to, uh, to live. Yeah, can, uh, again, said, said the wrong word. word. But uh, the key words that he did say is that Jesus of Nazareth was the righteous one. Uh, he, in fact... Uh, is the Messiah, and he's the one calling the shots. He's the one directing me. He's the one that gave me this commission to go uh, to the Gentiles. Paul is saying, these are not my ideas. These are the ideas given to me by God, by God directly. So this becomes very important I, in sharing our testimony. You know, when Kathy and I were first saved, we kind of, <coughs> all our friends were kind of a, a quasi a new age and, and so forth. Uh, and some of them were not quasi. They were weird. And, uh, and, and we would try to, uh, and I, I won't even go there. But uh, uh, anyway, we, we would do, do our best, you know, as brand new Christians, to share our testimony. And the thing is, they were very excited. Man, we had this experience with Jesus, and they would hear the whole thing, and then, man, they would just big smiles on their face, you know. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Man, that is so great. That is so good for you. That's great. You have your way, and I have my way. Yeah, that, that, and that's what that would be the response all the time. You have your way, I have my way. Hey, if you you found what works for you, man, that's awesome. Because they were spiritual people, man. They love to hear this stuff. This is great, uh, and everything. And it was kind of a stumping point, you know, for us sometimes in uh, in sharing our testimony. But Paul's very careful to say that. This was by divine intervention. I'm not sharing my own ideas. I'm sharing with you God's word. And, uh, and there's where we can answer that. It's good for you, but not for me. No, it's not up to me. When I'm talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ and having my sins forgiven, I didn't make this up. I didn't take a little bit from this religion and a little bit from that religion. I didn't do something that makes me feel better. I mean, we share with people sometimes... And they'll say, but you know, I, I found a different way. Uh, you, you know what? In fact, people can find things that actually help them. They, they can, in fact, pull some things out of Buddhism and some very moral teaching. Uh, they can borrow from over here, and they can uh, develop kind of a, an, an ethical code or, or behavior, and it helps them. They're, they're, they're not, they're, they have a tendency to not be criminals then. Uh, they have a tendency to have better relationships then. Uh, they, they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives to help them, but they can do, they can do better, uh, and then they can experience a, a better life as a result. The problem is those things can never make them righteous because they're not from God. They're just things that they've made up and they've borrowed. Uh, it's things of their own, own invention. That's the difference between your testimony and somebody that says, it's okay for you, but I have my own way. You have your own way. What is that way exactly? And where did it come from? Uh, because I can tell you, one day we're all going to stand before God. And the only question is, not did you have a good life. 
not even if you had a moral life. In fact, your life might be more moral than mine. The question is, are you righteous or not? And man can never make himself righteous. It's, we're only made righteous because God intervenes and makes us righteous. That's our testimony. It's based on God's word and what he has to say. Listen, I, I can tell you the, uh, the merits of eating peanut butter every day and you're going to have a better life. And there might be a few people that take that challenge and go, yeah, I'm actually doing better. I like that theology. But it won't help you on the judgment day. And uh, you think that's bizarre? I've heard, I've heard more bizarre in terms of people in their uh, spiritual walk and why they think what they're doing is going to help them have a better life. And in some cases, it might actually help them have a better life. So based on experience, they think they're okay but they're not okay. But we, have, we all have a story to tell. Uh, but my whole point is, you actually kind of have to write it down. <laughs> you have to kind of think it through. Because there's times when you have a, a 90 second shot with your testimony. Sometimes you got four and a half minutes somewhere. Sometimes you're on a plane. You got that guy for two hours, you know, and he's going to hear the whole deal or whatever. If you can keep him interested and, uh, and somehow relate to him and he believes that you care about him, uh, in that you're being honest and truthful. Uh, but you can deal with the, that's okay for you, but I have my own way, uh, the way that Paul did, and saying these are not my own ideas, uh, they've actually come from God. Well, let's look at the consequences of, uh, of this testimony in verse 23, as we uh, see the uh, military folks jump back into the, the story here. Then as they cried out uh, and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, and they said that he should be examined under scourging so that it, they, uh, he might know why they shouted so against him. Uh, and as they uh, bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Uh, then the commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. The commander answered, with a large sum of money, I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, but I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman. Uh, and because he had bound him the next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. We'll look at that conversation next time. But the consequences include, uh, again, Paul needing to be rescued uh, because uh, of the, uh, them trying to get at him once again, uh, and it also required him revealing his Roman citizenship. What they did to Paul as a Roman citizen is illegal. To bind him, now they're getting ready to scourge him, right? So they've got him on the rack, uh, and this is the same scourging that Jesus received. This could have uh, killed the Apostle Paul. Uh, it was going to be brutal. Uh, he knew that it was illegal. I'm not sure why he waited so long. We weren't there, but it, it may be it, this is the first time he could get a word in edgewise. Uh, and he uh, just kind of, uh, he drops a bombshell. Did I mention the fact that I'm a Roman citizen? Which for those men in that room carried the death penalty. They could all die. You touch a Roman citizen that way, you put them in chains and you treat them that way, you could die. And they all knew it. And they're like, okay, we're, uh, we're going up the chain of command here. Commander, you probably should know, this guy's a Roman citizen. And, uh, and uh, when it says he was afraid, I didn't look at it in the Greek, but I think it means he wet his pants at that point. <laughs> he's, he's afraid. And so he comes in and he kind of, well, how'd you get your citizenship? You know, I, I bought mine with a large sum of money. Claudius Lysias, uh, I'm told, is, uh, uh, indicates in his, uh, in his name that he's, he's at least part Syrian. He's not a Roman. So he's had to work his way up, save a lot of money to buy his Roman citizen. And then Paul comes back and goes, ah, I was born a Roman. You know, it's like, oh, great. That makes it even worse. And, uh, uh, and so I, I think they probably treated Paul real nice uh, at, at that point. Uh, and this whole thing uh, begins to change for uh, the Apostle Paul. And we can look at all of this and go, what was this all about anyway? Uh, because we've been talking about what makes an effective testimony. How many people got saved that day from the Apostle Paul's testimony? 
We don't know if any. But, you know, you know I, I, I would like to think there was a few people in the crowd going, that kind of makes sense to me. You know, I, I know there's a bunch of Christians. I'm going to go talk to You know, we don't really we won't know until we get to heaven. But as far as we know, as far as we know from the text, no, there was no immediate response to the gospel. And I want to say that doesn't mean his testimony wasn't effective because he delivered the goods. He did what he had to do. He said all the elements he needed to say, and he predicated and based it all on God's divine intervention and God's work. And he wouldn't compromise the truth of God even when it came to going to the same Gentiles at the end. That's what Jesus said, so I'm not changing Jesus' words. He would say that it was an effective testimony. When we share, it's never on us how the other person responds. They might respond. They might respond later. It's up to us, though, to just deliver the goods uh, and share our testimony. And the other thing we have to admire about the Apostle Paul, his courage under a crisis. And this is not, yeah, we've seen it before in the missionary journeys. We're going to see it under these uh, trials that he stands under now. Uh, but uh, under the greatest crisis, Paul always rose. Doesn't mean he wasn't afraid, right? I mean, Jesus shows up in Corinth and says, uh, uh, you can stop being afraid now. That's because he was afraid. You know, and uh, he's, he's writing a letter saying, sure, appreciate it. Somebody prayed for me so that, you know, I'm kind of, I don't know if you notice, I'm in chains. It would kind of help me out if I could be bold. Will you please pray for me? Paul's a regular guy, uh, but he's always able to rise to the occasion, be very courageous when it comes to somebody else's salvation. Uh, it starts with having a heart for the lost, uh, but it starts with a little preparation as, as well. I mean, to, and that's, it's a good little, it's a good little exercise to think about how you would share your testimony. I'm just telling you, it's better than making it up as you go along. You know, I mean, God can help you. The Holy Spirit can give you the words and so forth. But it's a good exercise to do, to think about your own testimony and the elements of it that need to be there to be an effective witness for, for Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for... Uh, Paul's courage. We thank you for his example. And uh, we pray that uh, <clears throat> we would be able to think through the elements of our own testimony to be able to uh, think about people we might come into contact with and what was our life like before that would be relatable to them, uh, that they would be interested in. Uh, and Lord, uh, again, basic elements, our story how desperate we were, or it was a, a, a thing uh, someone said on the radio, or uh, it was a scripture we read, the things that led to us hearing the gospel, perceiving, and making that decision to receive Jesus Christ uh, as our Lord and Savior. And then, Lord, uh, and may we glory in the changes, uh, some of the things that have happened uh, in our lives. And I pray that that part uh, is a big part of the testimony. Some very specific, concrete things. Because there's people out there that are looking for healing in their lives uh, from brokenness. Uh, they want some kind of hope in their life. They want to be forgiven of their sins. Uh, they want their marriages healed. Uh, they want wisdom for raising their, their kids. That might be elements in, in your testimony that somebody's waiting to hear. Lord, so help us prepare. But, and then at that moment, Lord, help us uh, be open to the leading and guiding of, of your spirit as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that God will use you, you know, that this week. I just think through it. And, you know, if you got your, your, your eyes open and your tennis up, uh, you know, you're just, if you're prepared, you're just a lot more apt. To, uh, you know, it's hard to share a Bible verse with someone that you've never me memorized. What was that? What was that verse? Oh man! I should... Oh, next time. You know, it's like <laughs> the more the more prepared we are, the more more God can use us. He uses us anyway, right? Speak, speaks through a donkey. You know, oh, that always encourages me. That story in the Old Testament, but uh, but you know, it helps to prepare a little bit too. And uh, and uh, Paul's a great example.
Let's all stand together. Open the heavens to our open 